Hi, everyone here and around the world. Yesterday, October 4th, 2022, my friend and UFO research colleague, Trajano Paiva in the Rio de Janeiro region of Brazil, sent me this Portuguese headline. Google translates as, quote, an agroglyph appears in a wheat plantation in the state of Santa Clarita in southeastern Brazil between Bom Jesus and Ipuassu, close quote. Here is a Google map where I have highlighted those towns about 500 miles southwest of Sao Paulo. Since the year 2008, crop circle patterns have repeatedly appeared in wheat fields there like this new one near the same towns during the months of October to November 2022, which is springtime now in the Southern Hemisphere. This October 4th, 2022 new pattern, also found between Ipuassu and Bom Jesus, is a single central circle surrounded by a triangle, surrounded by a single ring, surrounded by a five-sided pentagon, inside a circle. It is five tram lines wide, estimated to be some 30 meters in diameter or about 100 feet. According to farmer Sergio Giroto, this is not the first time that a mysterious pattern has appeared on his farm. He says seven years ago in 2017, there was another crop circle about 200 meters from where this new one appeared yesterday, October 4th, 2022. The farmer is puzzled about how the new large crop circle was made because there are no trails, no traces of equipment needed to work the wheat into the pattern. Whether crop formations, bloodless animal mutilations, human abductions, unidentified aerial phenomena, all of those mysterious phenomena. They've been linked since World War II onward to the presence of non-human intelligences interacting with Earth, even if a lot of that linking has been top secret and never shared publicly. In fact, my television documentary, A Strange Harvest, produced in 1979 to 1980 at the CBS station in Denver, was not my first interviews with scientists, medical people, and others who reported firsthand information, often confidential, of aerial craft that emitted beams of light that could lift or lower animals or humans. Five years before, in 1974 to 1976, I was in Boston producing medical and science programs at WCVB-TV, the ABC affiliate. One studio roundtable broadcast featured astronomers from MIT and Harvard. The question discussed was, in such a huge universe, isn't it logical there would be other life, even if we humans on Earth had no proof? At the time, the discussions were physics and chemistry, not UFOs and ETs on the studio roundtable. But after the broadcast, I asked one of the astronomers what he thought of pilot Kenneth Arnold's sighting of nine strange craft near Mount Rainier in Washington and the July 1947 headline about a UFO crash near Roswell, New Mexico. The astronomer said a colleague of his was working on a book about the whole universe being conscious. He offered to set up a meeting with me in Boston, and that's how I came to visit Itziak Bentoff at his home in 1976. On the coffee table in front of us were some of his hand-drawn illustrations that fill his now famous book released in 1976 entitled Stalking the Wild Pendulum. On the back cover, was a perfect summary of Bentoff's profound work. Quote, Our bodies mirror the universe, down to the working of each cell. We are pulsating beings in a vibrating universe in constant motion between the finite and the infinite. Our brains are thought amplifiers, not thoughts sources. Close quote. 
Itziak Bentov had worked with scientists studying the mind over matter abilities of Israel's famous metal bending telepathic phenomenon, Yuri Geller. Geller had even been studied by the Central Intelligence Agency about his ability to see photos and illustrations telepathically that were hidden in secure rooms far from Yuri Geller. Here is a cover page from a CIA Stanford Research Institute approved for release in 2003 about experiments Yuri Geller at Stanford Research Institute August 4 to 11, 1973. The objective of this group of experimental sessions is to verify Geller's apparent paranormal perception under carefully controlled conditions and psychological variables underlying his apparent ability, close quote. Jumping down to the underlying sentence, quote, as a result of Geller's success in this experimental period, we consider that he has demonstrated his paranormal perceptual ability in a convincing and unambiguous manner, close quote. It was only three years after that CIA report about Yuri Geller that I was sitting with Itziak Bentov in 1976 in Boston as he showed me illustrations for his new book. And that's when Bentoff told me that one of the most extraordinary events that he'd ever been witness to in his consciousness research was with Uri Geller. Bentoff told me the location was a university lab office on the fourth floor. That morning, he and other scientists had been testing Uri Geller's mind over matter abilities, and they were breaking for lunch. Bentoff told me, that Yuri Geller was right in front of the scientists as they went out of the office down to the stairs. And then he was not there. Bentoff said he yelled, Uri, where are you? And then the scientists started running down the four flights of stairs as fast as they could. At the bottom, they burst through the door to the parking lot. Bentoff told me they couldn't believe it. At the end of one distant row of parked cars, was Uri Geller with his back leaning against a car with his arms folded in front of him, and he was grinning. Bentoff told me, I think Uri Geller teleported from the fourth floor to that car. And now for the first time since that 1976 discussion with Itziak Bentoff in Boston, this week on October 1st, 2022, I was able to finally ask Uri Geller what happened. It tested me around the world under rigorous scientific conditions. And Itziak Bentoff was a witness with those scientists on that fourth floor of that lab that I believe was in New York City that he described. Yes. But let me tell you something about Itziak Bentoff. He was also instrumental in introducing me to the CIA with Ed Mitchell and Andrea Puharich. And all those tests that I had undergone at Stanford Research Institute were CIA material were financed by the CIA. I can even go further that NSA, National Security Agency, were extremely interested about me. And a few years ago, through the Freedom of Information Act, NSA released some secret documents. NSA found out that I dematerialized an alloy in London with a group of scientists headed by MI5. There were witnesses there like Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote 2001. There was Professor John Hasted. There was even physicist David Bohm, who was a friend of Albert Einstein. And they actually saw a tangible piece of alloy disappear in front of their eyes, penetrated a wall, and appeared in the next room. Now, NSA read about that. Most of your listeners know that for decades, governments were interested 
in telepathy, telekinesis, remote viewing. NASA and CIA became extremely interested after this report that cited the British scientists. I'm now reading out of the NSA document that was released for publication. After seeing me, Uri Geller, objects left the room, some of which apparently reappeared later. Now, this didn't surprise the unnamed scientists who found it no hard to believe that objects could disappear and reappear, the detected particles emerging from energy and dissolving or disappearing back into energy. So the idea, Linda, was to weaponize psychic ability. So there are many scientists around the world who will vouch to you that dematerialization, teleportation do happen when I'm involved. And that day that Isiak Bentov was a witness that you yourself may not even have fully understood that you were not doing a joke, but that something happened on that fourth floor and you ended up at the destination of the car that the scientists had to run downstairs and run out to get to you and that you yourself might not have even understood what happened. Linda, I even don't understand it today. I can tell you that maybe the hands of aliens are involved, positive aliens, good aliens. I believe that they are among us. I've been a witness. Let me just tell you another teleportation phenomenon. While I was being studied at the Stanford Research Institute, Edgar Mitchell and Hal Putoff and Russell Targ, we all went to have lunch in the cafeteria. And I ordered for dessert a scoop of vanilla ice cream. And as I was lifting the spoon into my mouth, I suddenly felt a metallic object inside the ice cream. So I spat it out, and I was kind of angry. You know, what on earth is a metallic object doing in my ice cream? And when I spat it out, Edgar Mitchell looks at it, picks it up with his fingers, cleans the ice cream off, and his face ashen. And he says to me, Uri, I know this from somewhere. When we walk back to the lab in the narrow corridor, suddenly all of us hear a clang, like something was hitting the wall and falling on the carpet. Edgar Mitchell picks it up and he says, Oh, my God. He pulls out the piece that was in my ice cream. He takes a piece that fell on the carpet, and he puts them together, and he says, Listen, guys, this is my tie pin. I lost this tie pin on a beach in Florida years ago. Wow. And what I'm wondering is, there is also a thread through your life, certainly in mine as an investigative reporter in science and environment, of other intelligences interacting with our planet, our solar system, that we are not alone. And I wondered if you could share the Sombrero UFO sketch that John Lennon did that I believe you purchased. He was referencing four thin-looking alien figures coming into his New York Dakota building room. Yes. One night, the phone rings. It was John Lennon. Uri, Uri, you got to come quickly. Something happened to me. I said to him, John, it's three o'clock in the morning. No, 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 no. you got to come. So I said to him, okay, John, let's meet halfway in a hotel. So I walk in the hotel lobby. And I see John Lennon standing in the corner. His face is white and he's trembling. I walk over to him and I say, John, what happened? John looks at me and he puts his left hand into his pocket and he pulls out 
really looks like a bronze egg. Take it, he says. My hand kind of collapses because it's so heavy. It's much heavier than what it looks. And I say to him, John, what is this? He says to me, Ori, I was lying in my bed. Suddenly, I see a sphere of light. Out of the sphere of light, I see an extraterrestrial hand coming out, and I see aliens. Uri, I want you to carry this object. Have it for the rest of your life. So it's actually in my museum, and it's right under the drawing of the UFO. And on my website, urigeller.com, there is a video clip, and you can hear John Lennon telling the story how he himself saw a UFO hovering right next to the United Nations building. Did John Lennon ever say to you, I think that these creatures, four of them that were small and thin, did you ever have a discussion about what it is that the beings want in these visitations at night? John said, peace on earth. Why do you think Imagine his amazing song. And let me tell you who else told me the same. Prince Philip, the husband of Queen Elizabeth II. I met him in St. James Palace. I was told by Prince Philip that they own the largest paranormal and alien library in the world. They have books about alien beings. And Prince Philip asked me, Uri, why are they around? Why do they come to visit us? Um, And I said, what do you think? He says, because they want to save our planet. The good aliens are here, and they are protecting us. The negative beings, the negative aliens, can't do anything to us. And I'll tell you again why. Because if the negative aliens were here, we would have been destroyed a long time ago. We're being protected by good aliens. Whether Uri Geller was the inspiration or not, teleportation physics was studied by the Air Force Research Lab at Edwards Air Force Base, California, from January 30th, 2001 to July 28th, 2003. The researcher was Eric W. Davis, a physicist from Warp Drive Metrics in Las Vegas, who wrote in the final report, quote, This study was tasked with the purpose of collecting information, describing the teleportation of material objects, providing a description of teleportation as it occurs in physics, its theoretical and experimental status, and a projection of potential applications. The study also consisted of a search for teleportation phenomena occurring naturally or under laboratory conditions that can be assembled into a model describing the conditions required to accomplish the transfer of objects. This included a review and documentation of quantum teleportation, its theoretical basis, technological development, and its potential applications. The characteristics of teleportation were defined and physical theories were evaluated in terms of their ability to completely describe the phenomena of teleportation. Contemporary physics, as well as theories that presently challenge the current physics paradigm, were investigated. The author identified and proposed two unique physics models for teleportation that are based on the manipulation of either the general relativistic space-time metric or the space-time vacuum electromagnetic zero-point fluctuations and their parameters. Naturally occurring anomalous teleportation phenomena that were previously studied by the United States and foreign governments were also documented in the study and are reviewed in this report. The author proposes an additional model for teleportation that is based on a combination of the experimental results from the previous government studies and advanced physics concepts. 
and then the report includes extensive teleportation bibliography and numerous recommendations for proposals for further theoretical research. So for people who might have come to the show tonight thinking, well, Uri Geller and teleportation and metal bending is not taken seriously by the government of the United States and other governments. The truth is they always have had a very serious interest. And I found it to be so fascinating to talk with Uri Geller after that in-depth discussion that I had with Itziak Bentoff in Boston in 1976 at his home, surrounded by the pages and illustrations that would go into what I consider to be one of the most profound books that I ever have read. And that being able to talk with him that day for hours has sort of left a feeling of a transfer of both interest in the universe, but almost more than that by itself, is my deep interest in trying to understand what consciousness is and what the relationship is to what we have the word soul for or about. And usually the two are not discussed in the same conference, the same paper, the same anything. But something in me, perhaps from that discussion with Itziak Bentov, feels profoundly that within our humanness, within our human consciousness, there is something that does go on beyond organic cycles of life and death. I personally am convinced of it and that the next great stage is sort of where Itziak Bentov left off in Stalking the Wild Pendulum and that Roger Penrose has discussed the idea that even our brains have a physical mechanism in very microscopic tubules that he hypothesizes might be there specifically to interact with the frequencies of the universe, of the cosmos. And we're still in a babyhood stage of Homo sapiens sapien. And if we can survive ourselves, we might be able to move out into the cosmos with both consciousness and the organic as the important framework together of everything that we do. And I hope that you enjoyed hearing this story of Itziak Bentov, because that day at his house and being able to ask him questions about all of those illustrations for those of you who have read the book, and hopefully this will inspire a lot of you to get Stalking the Wild Pendulum. It is an extraordinary, an extraordinary encounter with a human consciousness trying to understand the cosmic consciousness. So on that note, Ian, hello, and I'm picking up the cell phone because I need to see if you have sound. I can hear you loud and clear, Linda. Are you hearing me okay? Yes, thank you. And thank you to all our audience for bearing with us with our technical issues earlier today. Thank you. Yeah, it was only at the beginning, but it's irritating when audio or video do not work. But we did it. We have gotten to this point. And I would love to know uh, what countries are with us and what's on people's minds after hearing this fascinating discussion with Uri Geller. Well, people are tuning in from all over the world. We're having uh, people from all over the United States and Canada, the United Kingdom, Scotland, Northern Ireland, many parts of Europe, including Sweden as well. We've got people uh, tuning in from South America. Peru, Chile, Ecuador are here, Ecuador and Central America, Mexico, parts of Mexico, Cuernavaca and Tepotzlan areas that, that I know quite well. Quite Ian, Ian, put out a general uh, question, comment, that if there's anybody in Brazil, especially in the areas that I opened up with this fascinating <laughs> crop formation, who has any more information about it, uh, and it may be that there are people who are studying them there secretly. I would love to hear from people in that southeastern area of Brazil 
about the fact that since at least 2008, there have been constant reappearances of crop formations in the same area, in the same towns. And that is exactly like it happened in Europe and in parts of the United States and Canada. There have always been certain geographical areas that get repeated patterns. What is that about? Is it, does it have to do with frequencies? Um, I would be open to hearing from any and all of you who might be scientists, who might be working for governments, military, as well as civilians about these areas like this one in southeastern Brazil, in which there now is this extraordinary crop formation and there probably will be more. That's right. I think we've sent a, a pretty good appeal out there and then just now, Linda, that anybody in that area, if they can contact us directly, we'd love to hear from yeah. people on the ground in that local area. So if anyone is there, please do contact us. We would like to hear more. So anyway, we've got people also adding from Nicaragua and, uh, and they're, they're joining us as well. And one guy has even called us in, says he's in Antarctica. Wow. So, <laughs> Ask him where he is in Antarctica. Is he two miles down, three miles down, or is he in a surface lap? <laughs> Matt Guffin, where are you exactly in Antarctica? It's not the first time we've had someone calling in from Antarctica. We'd love to hear from you too. So yes, people were fascinated with that image that you put up there of the crop circle, that actually likening that to perhaps a clock showing a time of 11 o'clock and we're having questions from many people who also understand about the crop circle phenomena about whether or not the nodes were blown on this one. We need, uh, it would be wonderful if I could establish a connection with people who are willing to try to work with a biophysicist or a biologist in that area. Uh, it's about 500 miles southwest of uh, Sao Paulo so in that region, it would be great for me to be able to link up with somebody who was seriously studying the crop formations, even if it has to be non-public, and then I could report uh, about information. And the blown nodes and the 90 degree angles that are layered, uh, seven, I think the most I've ever seen are seven distinct different layers, all going 90 degrees to each other up uh, 12 to 14 inches from the soil, all layered. And these are the kinds of physical facts and data that the more we can document, the more we set aside these phenomena that really cannot be explained easily. And that is the whole goal, to separate out the easy dismissal from what the actual physical scientific studies show. And the same thing is happening with UFO UAPs. When Luis Elizondo goes through that list of eight to 14 observables and we're dealing with hard physical data, that is really important and sets the UFO UAP phenomena into a different category than it has been treated in the past. So all of us together, those that are seriously interested in gathering data, interfacing with scientists that can interface with me, that would be for me, that would be a goal for us to try to keep working toward more of that as we get into 2023. So, Ian, what have we got in terms of specific comments or questions tonight? People are fascinated by uh, Yuri's uh, interaction with John Lennon and John Lennon's uh, yeah. interaction there with the ETs and the golden uh, ball or egg-shaped object as well. So they're fascinated to hear this new information that many people weren't aware of. And Ian, for everybody to realize that gold egg that so scared John Lennon, and he put it in Uri Geller's hand and said, I want you to keep this for the rest of your life. That is in the Uri Geller Museum in the Haifa region of Tel Aviv, Israel right now, along with the, uh, I think that there's more than one tape of uh, John Lennon in the museum discussing some of these matters with Uri Geller. And then there are other fascinating pieces that he has put in the museum related to what he's experimented with, with what others have experimented with him. And of course, 
uh, you see when you go to origeller.com that uh, he is using a car that is stacked with hundreds of bent spoons, mind over matter, as sort of a metaphor for uh, his life and, and the museum. And it's sort of funny because I really think that the contribution that Ori Geller has given are all the serious aspects of all the serious research that have been done with him. That's right, and it's fascinating as well to visit Yuri's website, yurigeller.com, where he actually uh, has a lot of more, a lot more information and illustrations, and goes into greater depth about these stories as well. Yes, and one footnote is that he bought an island. Uh, I think it was in uh, it was a few years ago. And it's called Lamb Island, and it is off of Scotland. And the reason that he bought that island is that well, he had always thought it would be nice to have an island, but he has these uh, inspirations, these intuitions where he sees things. He feels that Lamb Island off the coast of Scotland and parts of Scotland are directly related to the period when the large pyramids played huge roles on the surface of this planet, wherever you want to begin, whether you go back to Egypt or Anunnaki or before. And that he has at the museum and at his website information about how he is trying to do two things. Eventually, he would like to see if he could explore more in this island related to ancient Egyptian history. But he's also opened it up like a micro nation in which people can get a citizenship certificate for a dollar, I believe it is. And what he's doing is making people aware, but at the same time, the money for uh, being uh, having a citizenship on the Lamb Island is to help uh, children uh, with uh, blood problems. And so this is an example of where many different uh, con there's a confluence of many different pieces of Ori Geller's life and interest in museum. They sort of come down to this Lamb Island, which, Ian, I assume you've heard about that before, and Ori Geller's buying it because of an interest in its ancient connection and Scotland to the time when uh, huge pyramids were all over this planet, perhaps even more than we have now. Yes, I'm familiar with it, and Yuri goes into a lot of detail on the website about that on yurigeller.com. So I'd advise all of our audience to visit the website and look at that and check that out for themselves. It's also interesting to mention that um, in the book Yuri by Andrija Puharic. Puharic. Uh, Andrija Puharic. Yeah. yeah. He details a lot of Yuri's background about his very first ET experiences from the age of three years old, which I believe uh, he attributes his his extraordinary gifts to be from um, ETs right. as well, to be given to him at three years old. Yeah, and that would be a very interesting story sometime perhaps, but I think he has told that and it has been out there. That's why tonight I wanted to share specifically about this whole idea of teleportation. And um, to that end, what questions do we have? Well, with the uh, he, with Yuri talking about being studied by the CIA, and apparently there's a lot of information from the CIA on, uh, on how they studied Yuri. The question is as well, from one of our audience, Christina, she says, was Yuri actually working for the CIA as well at some stage? I know that in my discussion with him that there were a lot of complexities about his either doing work or being involved in various intelligence agency efforts. Um, he names several people that were working either for the CIA, NSA, others uh, in the rest of the interview. And my just out of my 43 years, of trying to get to the bottom first of animal mutilations and everything that has come since. I have a conflict feeling about all of the various 
different investigations that were put together by various agencies of our government working with MI6 in the UK and probably MI5 and other intel agencies focused on the whole issue of what are exactly the intelligences behind all of the UFO phenomena and that that sprouted like a broccoli with a thousands, thousands, thousands of projects and that the complexity of being so talented as I think Uri Geller was in, and I think he would say so, especially in his uh, young years in the 20s and to the 30s, and that the government, if I were running the government, I would also want to work and collaborate with people who had gifts and work in uh, studies that would be secret. So you run into the practicality of you're a government, military, you have to protect your, com your country, you ha have to investigate a tremendous number of various layers that would relate to phenomena and the complexity of the phenomena that has been reported since World War II, while protecting your sources, protecting the information from perceived enemies. It's the same uh, issues that we're hearing discussed now. And in that context, it wouldn't surprise me at all that Uri Geller and others with talents would end up having either a contract or they would be working in a project like he did with Stanford Research Institute. And that was working with Hal Putoff and Andrea Poharek and uh, others at Stanford Research Institute. And that is, to me, just that that's part of what you expect if you're going to investigate complex subjects seriously. You have to have investigations a, long, a wide range, but then you run into the problem that eventually it feels like that we, the taxpayers, we should know what our government knows about other life in the universe and whether teleportation and telepathy and all of it are part of what we must learn when eventually we are finally introduced to other intelligences, which our government has been working with in a variety of ways since uh, the years right after World War II to today and ongoing. It, and when you hear people from military or intelligence or science, medicine, aerospace say, of course we're not alone in this universe. That's the jump off for where we all need to go now as we move it toward 2023. If all these people know, why can't we? Go ahead, Eric. Go ahead, Ian. Okay. And we've got a question from Cisco Kid. I don't know if you can answer this or not. He says, did Yuri actually feel a change in his body before and after he teleported? Uh would you restate the question exactly again? Yeah, it's, did Yuri actually feel a change in his body before and after he teleported? I can't answer for him on that. When I uh, told him about what Itziak Bentov uh, had told me, and his very first words were the emphatic what you have just shared is absolutely true. He has a mind that jumps. He, he jumps to, the, to other teleportations, a very long one in, that involved Andrea Puharik. So he started going to other uh, areas where he had experienced teleportation and was telling me about the physicalness of some others to reinforce that what Bentoff had told me had absolutely happened. So I can't answer specifically about whether he remembered 
that day in 1970, what would have been, I'm hearing it in 76, so it happened in that period of time, 70 to 76, that he didn't go into exactly what he felt by going from the fourth story down to the car. Uh, it would be interesting to go back and ask him if we could go through that. But it was so fascinating to hear about his other teleportation events and what happened with John Lennon. And that's why I can't give you a specific answer to that specific event beyond the fact that it happened and Itziak Bentoff was there as a scientist witness. Okay, no, that's that's good. But, uh, you know, people are still are just speculating really on whether or not he did actually feel any changes in his body when he did did uh, did teleport himself. Yeah, and I can follow up with him, uh, and I yeah, will do that, and add, and then I'll add it to next week's show. That would be that would be interesting. Yeah. As well, people are speculating that perhaps you know the agencies, uh, the CIA's interest in these technologies and uh you know these abilities why is it that perhaps uh, a question is uh, as well from the audience why is it that certain people like russell targ were able to talk about their experiences that they um, that were monitored by the cia i suppose it has to do with the type of non-disclosure agreements and other agreements uh, that scientists doctors medical people of, uh, of other uh, physics, uh, all of the various fields that you can think of with sophisticated work, they may have more open contracts, let's say with the director of a medical laboratory. But if they go to one of the agencies, the intel agencies, and they want to work with, uh, let's say Edwards Air Force Base, by definition, the combination of CIA or NSA or DIA or uh, any of the geospatial with then a military sophisticated place, it would automatically, everything would be uh, classified. But if you do a contract that is normal and straightforward with a medical center or a science lab or with a talented person like Uri Geller, it may be that the NDAs are not so binding, and that might have applied to some of the work that Targ did and others, uh, and Hal Putoff certainly has uh, talked about many things that they did at the Stanford Research Institute. So I think that it is a measure of how uh, stiff the non-disclosure agreements have been at various stages. And now we're at this new crossroads, we still don't know what Congress is going to do, but if they do pass the amendment to the uh, Defense Authorization Act, it wouldn't make it easy for people who have already signed non-disclosure agreements to talk to me, a reporter. That would still be verboten. But the idea, as I understand it, is that there has been so much intimidation so many threats, so many people afraid of their shadow inside of agencies, inside of aerospace, inside of science labs that in which they have been dealing with extraterrestrial biological entity, technology, and live and dead and all of it. They, that There are people who are actually dealing with those truths and they can't share anything. And if they tried to share with a supervisor, they might even get in trouble doing that. And it's my understanding that this is a layered change, that people who have signed NDAs or who will sign NDAs would not be penalized for going to their bosses, for going into others' superiors to talk about what it is in the phenomena that they are dealing with. So uh, to clarify that one more, Robert Salas told me it was very clear to him after the 10 nuclear missiles went down every second uh, at Malmstrom that 
right after, I believe it was in 20, 24 or 48 hours, he gets, I believe it was an order because he was in working in the Air Force. I think it was an order that he was to go to the base psychiatrist's office and he was to tell the psychiatrist everything that happened about the missiles going down. And Bob Salas is an intelligent person and he said, I, I drove there, I got to the building of the psychiatrist. And he said, and then I was overwhelmed with the thought, this is a trap. If I go forward and I talk with the psychiatrist, I will completely ruin the rest of my life and career. And he turned around and left. It is that kind of intimidation, association, with people feeling their entire lives, their careers will be ruined because they are associated with investigations of extraterrestrial biological entities, are working with uh, extraterrestrial biological entities like the Tall Whites and the Nordics, and that the complexity of having knowledge that you cannot share at all with anybody has been overwhelming for a lot of people. And hopefully by January that Christopher Mellon is correct, that there will be this last minute rush to get something like this amendment to the Defense Authorization Act done in December and becoming effective law by January 2023. Um, it's not an answer to what the public wants to know, but it may help people who are working in very, very difficult and challenging programs be able to talk with more people. And that might be a, a, a big help. Okay, what else have we got? I'd like to do the super chats, Linda. Thank you very much to our generous audience yes. tonight. I'm not going to go through them now. Yeah. Sarah, Sarah Enriquez, Terry, Caroline Boyce, Jessica Rodriguez, Christina Ledesma Jimenez, Alba Pedreo, Zip784. I'd like to give a special mention as well to Moonbird, who can't be with us tonight, and uh, we wish him a speedy recovery. He's not well tonight. And they said yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. if I understand correctly, bless his heart, like me, like so many people that I know now, who we made it all through uh, the COVID pandemic up to now, without getting anything, and now we are getting COVID, and it is miserable. Yeah, we wish him a, a, a speedy recovery. Also, a shout out to experience Elisa Savoy, who's uh, uh, just celebrating her 56th revolution around our nearest star as well today. Happy revolution. If, if uh, we all could continue with revolutions that we just kept learning more, getting more energy, and not decrescendo, but crescendoing out. That's the way I wish life worked. Linda, can we just remind everyone to like and subscribe, please? Yes, I really appreciate hearing from you in all of your written mail and your emails and your texts, how much you appreciate Earth Files. That means everything to me. And if you are not a subscriber, uh, I would appreciate it if you would click on that lower right subscription button because it doesn't cost you anything, but it helps us in the YouTube world. And if you like tonight's program, last week's program, all the programs, some people have seen every single one and rerun them and tell me about the reruns and what else that they see in the reruns, well, hit the like button. All of this helps keep the hard work going and making it feel like it's something that not only do I want to do, but I feel like there's something about this timeline that all of us must be getting into these subjects for what is coming next. Okay, Ian. Okay, Anita Rivera Cash has given us a question. She says, I have memories of ETs from 10 months old, and I believe before I was born. Is this, is this usual with me all my life? I'm in my 70s now. 
Leo Sprinkle wanted me to share with you long ago. No, baby memory, baby consciousness is very rare. But it has happened, I rem- as she or was, uh, as you were describing, what came into my mind, and I believe it was a case in uh, Massachusetts, and it was, uh, and it was a woman. And she remembered vividly, she insisted, that she was in a crib. She could see the vertical rungs. That she sees herself grabbing a hold and that she was old enough to be strong enough to pull herself up. I think most mothers and dads would understand that. And that she... Uh, was telling me vividly how she was pulling herself up so she was standing, holding on to the rungs of the bed. So she was either somewhere in that one to, one-ish to two-ish age. And that a ball of light came from a closet. That's the one thing I would say if there's a common denom- denominator in a lot of people's uh, stories or memories. It has to do with closets, being a child, sometimes babiness up to toddlers and beyond. And the closet they associate with orbs, meaning little lights, or spheres of light that can be somewhere either baseball size, softball size, basketball size. Usually nothing is much bigger than a basketball, but they are referred to as glowing spheres. The sound of buzzing bees that is associated with the orbs or the spheres of light in closets. Why the non-human intelligence would choose to do it this way, I don't know, but that is a very common, common denominator. Now, in the case in Massachusetts that I'm remembering, the woman talking to me is many decades later, remembering this vividness of pulling herself up and seeing the sphere of light coming from the closet. As a lot of people do, the light comes toward them and then there is an amnesia. Whether or not the memory is there in the subconscious or the mind that could be accessed, that's what Uh, Bud Hopkins and John Mack and Leo Sprinkle, they work so hard on that question and seeing and probing. And with some people under hypnosis, a whole huge other event unfolds. But in many people, it is, and they will say this, it is as if I have been deliberately made to forget And some people in the abduction syndrome even remember that they're given something. They either drink it or they feel like it's a shot or something specifically to erase the memory of if it's a trip aboard a craft or whatever the issue is, that there is specific memory wipes that go along with being a human abductee. And then when you talk with people who have been in military operations related to extraterrestrial biological entities, you hear military people say that they knew that the day that they were ordered to go and get, it was either a shot or to drink a kind of green, uh, strange fluid, uh, liquid that didn't taste good. They associate that, those orders, with memory erasures. So it could be that our government uses memory erasures, extraterrestrial biological entities use memory erasures, and that might explain why there are tremendous complexities and differences person to person about how many people remember in granular detail to the point that it is like I am watching a movie when I'm interviewing And that the granular detail is coming out in huge, huge waves because I end up being the only person that they feel that they could ever 
just start gushing and gushing. And that has happened uh, three hours, three hour long while somebody suddenly is remembering a lot. And then there are others that get up to, I grabbed a hold of the rungs of the bed and I see a light and everything is gone after that. So it's very complex. But the one thing that I feel strongly to share with you guys and hopefully that you will always feel that the Earth Files is a place where we should be able to talk about all of the bell-shaped curved aspects from the good to the bad and in between without being afraid, without feeling that we would be ostracized, ridiculed. That phase of history, I feel, should go. It must. And we are now going to go, I hope it's 2023, I hope they use the James Webb Telescope to hone in on one of the planets at TRAPPIST-1 or someplace else where they know that the chemistry signature that every scientist on the planet can look at and say, the only way this signature in this atmosphere could exist is there is biological life there. I'm waiting for that, that much. And once it's finally, we're not alone in the universe, no matter how the headline unfolds. My prayer is that it will be a new springtime for thousands, millions of people who have these snippets of memory or big pieces of memory to know that there's a lot of minds and consciousnesses on earth who have shared the same types of experiences and that it is related to the presence, an alien presence that has been on this planet as far as I know for at least 270 million years and that the, those alien presences do not all get along and that over the last 270 million years, according to the Defense Intelligence Agency analysts who talked to me in December of 1999, three competing extraterrestrial civilizations have been competing with each other over this wonderful, incredible planet for at least 270 million years. And right now, you guys, 2023, we might finally get that one piece of profound truth. Homo sapiens sapien is not alone in this universe. Neanderthalensis was not alone in this universe. Denisovans were not alone in this universe. And it goes back a long way. I find it exciting. I do not find it scary. I find it inevitable it's inevitable truth in a universe that the James Webb Telescope and Hubble have shown us for a long time. There are trillions of galaxies and life, organic life, advanced consciousness is not rare. And eventually we're going to have those headlines. Meanwhile, you guys, I look forward to seeing you every Wednesday as much as we can going forward into the rest of this year and into a new year that might be historic on that headline. I love you guys. See you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button.
taking place. Maybe it's because select subtitle CC. I say you want to get a column, and then and select auto translate. Running, and I don't have to put them in. Select a language. Bind them anywhere they love and the captions the will now appear in that language. Sort of gone through and they will hold their heads. I never had a cat do that before. And they'll pull against the comb, helping me get out snarls. And I think it's the best they've ever been.